Hey friends, I am so glad that you're joining us this morning. Hey, I want to encourage you. This is our time to worship together as a church. We want to worship God in song. So anytime we're singing a song, sing with us. Let's all sing together. Anytime we are in the word and we're hearing the message today that Pastor Sammy is bringing to us, let's take notes. We want to make sure that this is a worship experience for you and your family and for all of us as a church family. And another way that we can join in together and worshiping together is by reading the scripture together. So I want you to read along with me there on your couch or in your recliner and read along with me from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It's going to be on the screen for you, but you can also follow along in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Pastor John, why don't you go ahead and lead us in our first song for tonight. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. What a privilege, honor to be with you. I'm just thankful for these folks that are here with me. Let me let me remind you who we've got. Colin's playing guitar tonight, and Miss Rita is on the keyboard, and Corbin's playing drums. I'm thankful for their service. I'm thankful that they do this because they love Jesus. And these two guys I've got singing with me, I'm really excited about them being here tonight. This fellow on my right is Jamie Head. Many of you know Jamie. Uh, he's got a great big heart for Jesus, and I'm so glad that he's here with us. But this guy over here is real special to me. This is my grandson, Jaron, from Hoover, Alabama. He's been with us for the last few days, and I've asked him if he'd come and sing with me. And it's a great joy to have him sing with me tonight. You know, we're here on Palm Sunday, and we think about that last week in the life of Jesus as Jesus was facing the cross. And he knew it's just a few days away, but he's facing it with humility and with courage. And those around him were worried about themselves. The disciples, they were so selfish. I think we have a tendency to be a little bit selfish sometimes. And I just hope that our lives can be more like Jesus. Humility and courage. And then God will exalt us. This says, Hallelujah for the cross. Up to the hill of Calvary, my Savior went courageously. And there he bled and died for me. Hallelujah for the cross. And on that day, the world was changed. The Oh, 
breath I'll have no need to fear that rest this hope will guide me into We come now to the part of our worship service where we have an opportunity to give back to the Lord. It's interesting in the New Testament that we are challenged to be cheerful givers. This can be hard. I see it in my own life. There's times when maybe the budget's tight or something goes wrong with a used car, or maybe there's something I want to buy or somewhere I want to go, and I think, oh, do I want to give? And yet God has been so faithful to me and to you. He is the ultimate giver. And our response, which is one of worship, the Lord is looking for a cheerful heart. Here at Emmanuel, we have several ways that you can give. The first is by mail. You can mail into P.O. Box 664, Benton, Illinois, 6281. One two. You can also give via phone. You can call in to 618, excuse me, text in to 618-202-2505 and text the words give, G-I-V-E. The other ways that you can give are online at our website or via our app. As we continue to worship, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, We thank you that you are good and that you are the giver and sustainer of all of life. Lord, we often struggle to follow you, and yet, Lord, you sent Jesus to die for us, and you have redeemed us. You have loved us first, and we we thank you for that. Lord, this morning, as we worship you, as we give back, may, may it be pleasing And may it be our joy to worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scripture says that he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus went to the cross so we didn't have to. His purpose was to Give us life just because he loves us.
So what can I say? 
Well, good morning, church. Good morning, friends. Good morning, family. Hey, Easter is next Sunday. For a Christian, for believers, Easter is like the World Series, the Super Bowl, the Final Four, and the Stanley Cup Championship all on one day. Easter is a great day of celebration as we celebrate the fact that Christ rose from the dead. And when Christ rose on that first Resurrection Sunday, Christ rose in victory over sin and victory over death, and his resurrection literally changes everything. I am so excited about celebrating Easter next Sunday. And I want to encourage you to think about who you could invite to celebrate Easter with you. I wish you could invite your one individual to come and worship here at Emmanuel, but unfortunately circumstances are not going to allow us to worship physically present. But maybe you have that cousin that lives in Chicago, maybe your neighbor, uh, or maybe someone that you, you even work with that you can invite to jump online and worship here online virtually with you on Easter. Let me encourage you to consider who you might bring to worship with you, to worship virtually on Easter Sunday. I think God might use it in a great way. Hey, this morning in preparation for celebrating Easter next Sunday, I want us just to consider who Jesus is. Much of our songs this morning were celebrating what Christ has done on the cross for us. And I want us to consider this morning how his life, how his example, how his death really charts a way for how we are to interact in this world and how we are to treat others. If you have your Bibles, won't you open them with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. As we want to consider Jesus this morning. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Here's what God's word says. If there is any encouragement in Christ... If any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love united in spirit intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. Adopt this same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking the likeness of humanity, and when he became as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What an exceptional passage we have this morning. And really, Paul is passionately pleading to the church and to the Christians in Philippi to look beyond their own needs to the needs of others. Apparently, there was a growing problem with selfishness and gossip and dissension within this church. And Paul was urging them to consider the attitude and the example of Jesus. So the very first verse, if there is any encouragement in Christ, and there is, if there is any consolation of love, and there is, if any fellowship with the Spirit, and there is, and if there's any affection and mercy, and he really, he's passionately pleading about what Christ has done in our life. See, Paul is writing this letter from pr- prison. He's in prison. And yet, he has all these blessings and all this joy despite his circumstance because of his relationship with Jesus. You see, friends, this pandemic, this shelter in place, maybe leading you to a dark place, a depressed place, place, a hard place, but I want to remind you that despite our circumstances, despite our situation, there is great joy for you in your relationship with Jesus, and that really is Paul's reminder here of the great joy that we have. This is the time that we let our faith take over, and our faith directs our emotions, and our faith directs our feelings. And so Paul's writing in prison, reminding himself of the encouragement and the mercy that he's received from King Jesus. 
And he writes trying to get individuals to, instead of thinking selfishly and about their own needs and own desires, to to look beyond those desires to the way that Christ lived and the way that Christ acted. See, something can be said, I believe, when we take off our focus off of our own needs and take our focus off of our own desires and we turn our focus to Jesus. We place our heart on him. I've heard of some preachers that make this passage a mandatory required reading for all marriages they do because I believe this has some important principles of how husbands and wives should treat each other and where there's joy when we treat each other in this kind of heart. So how do you fight selfish desires? How do you fight last week? Anxiety and worry. I think we consider Jesus. And in this text, in, in verse six through verse 11, Paul quotes an early Christian hymn. This hymn may have been sung by the church in Philippi or other churches throughout um, the known area at the time. But it's a, it's a hymn rich with truth about who Christ is and what Christ has done. See, we're reminded in this passage that Jesus gave of himself. Jesus literally emptied himself. He made himself nothing. Verse six and verse seven reminds us that Jesus is equal in nature and deity with God the Father. Whatever it is, the substance, the the attributes that makes God, God, Jesus is all of that. But Jesus didn't think of the advantages that he had as deity as a reason for him not to come to earth and be born as a baby. He wasn't willing to regard himself as too lofty, but really he made himself as nothing. He took the form of, of a human, of a baby. He refused to make a selfish choice and he sets aside his position for your sake, for my sake. You know, we often talk about rags to riches story. I think about the Beverly Hillbillies, an old um, TV show many, many years ago. It was a comic TV show about these hillbillies who struck it rich and found oil on their home place. And they sold what, what all they had and they moved to Beverly Hills. And it's a, it's a comic sitcom, if you will, about how these hillbillies with all these riches and how they live in Beverly Hills. And yet Jesus did the quite opposite, didn't he? He went from the highest of heavens, the most glorious of all glories, to the most lowly depths, to even to the cross. It really is a riches to rags story of how Jesus emptied himself for you and for me. And the distance that Jesus traveled was because how much he loves you. Oh, what a savior we have. Oh, what a wonderful savior Jesus is. He empties himself, and the Bible says he takes the form of a servant. We see the emptying of Jesus and his servant um, nature and his servant attitude when he was born in a barn. We see it as he lived and how he, he cared for the poor and the sick and the depressed. We see it in how he dies in such a humiliating way. He empties himself and gives all of his life. He dies for our salvation. Jesus could have come to earth as he is, as his true nature is. He could have came to earth as the king of kings and lord of lords, but he empties himself and comes to earth as a human baby. And I'm reminded of the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, that says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty, you might become rich. Really think about how Christ has emptied himself and gave himself. It's really the opposite of what Adam did. You know, scripture calls Jesus the first, the second Adam, and Adam is the first Adam. And the Adam in the garden, he wanted to be like God. He was grasping at wanting to have divine-like attributes. But in the end, Adam only tasted death. But Jesus, the second Adam, He had all the deity, he had all the divine attributes because he's God, but yet he surrenders it and tastes death so that you and I might have eternal life. See, Paul reminds us of the emptying, of of, of the giving that Jesus does here in scripture because he wants us to 
And he wants to influence the church in Philippi to empty of themselves and to care about others, to care for others in need. As we consider the example of Jesus, we can care for someone in need. I mean, that's what verse four says. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Reminded of a story of something that one of our church members did this week. One of our retired couples said, you know what, I can't do much, but I can grill hot dogs, I can grill bratwurst, and they grilled some hot dogs and bratwurst, and they got some sides together, and they took meals to some of our senior adults to try to cheer them up and just provide for them. I mean, I think that's living out, um, and that's following the example of Jesus. I love it. How can you do that in your life? How can Christ's example of him giving himself, of him emptying himself, How can that be modeled in your life? That's what God wants us to do. Notice in our text, not only does Christ empty himself, but Christ also humbles himself to the cross. Verse eight says, and he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. See, Jesus humbles himself to rescue us, to pardon us, so that we could be saved. Jesus is obedient to God's plan for your salvation. See, Jesus chose to obey the Father's plan. He chose to obey the Father's purpose, even when it involved a painful death. See, the cross was part of God's plan. From the very start of creation, God planned it for Jesus to die as our sacrifice. See, when you read the crucifixion story, sometimes you might wrongly think that it was Pilate was in charge deciding Jesus' fate. There was a Sanhedrin that was in charge by, by surrendering Jesus to be crucified. Or it was Judas who was framing Jesus. But no, it was God's plan from the start for Jesus to die for your salvation. And Jesus humbles himself and is obedient to God's plan. Thursday night before Jesus' arrest, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows what God has planned. He knows what lies ahead throughout the night on Thursday, through Friday of his crucifixion. And Jesus is is, is with agony. He's praying. And what's his prayer? Father, not your will, not my will, but your will be done. See, Jesus is praying, and he's surrendering to God's plan. He's obedient to God's plan. He dies for our salvation. And Jesus endures the, not only a humbling cross, but the humiliating cross. The cross isn't just a painful and horrible way to die. It's a humiliating way to die. It was death that the Romans used for foreigners and slaves. See, Roman citizens couldn't die by cross. It was thought of inhumane. To Jews, those who died by the cross, the Jews thought as that individual as as cursed. It was reserved for the lowliest of lowly individuals. And that is the way that Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, humbled himself and died. You know, when they crucified Jesus, he probably probably took every bit of clothing that was on his body. A very humiliating way there he hung and suffered and died for your salvation. Really, it shows the depth of Jesus' love for you. Enduring the humiliating the cross. I can't read these words that Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. I can't read those words without a little bit of awe in my heart that God would love us with this kind of love, that Jesus would love us enough to humble himself with this kind of love, that he would endure this for our salvation. See, his death was a death like no other. Now, other people have died on the cross, but other people, when they died on the cross, they died because they deserved it. But Jesus didn't die because he deserved death. He died because we deserved death. And he died in our place. He, he suffered because of our sins. He endured because of the wrath that we incurred against God. See, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 18, 
For Christ also suffered for sin once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring you to God. The death of Jesus was nothing less than Christ experiencing hell, literally experiencing hell, so that you and I might not face hell one day, but that you and I might face salvation in heaven one day. See, we've got an awesome Savior. And Paul here, as he's writing the church at Philippi that's dealing with dissension and gossip and selfishness, he writes them reminding us of, of the emptying and the humbling that our example, that our Savior did for our salvation. And as we re-examine how Christ has lived, we should re-examine how we treat others and how we look at others. Consider Jesus. If Christ is our great example and we consider Jesus, then we can put others' needs ahead of our own preferences. See, Paul was seeking to encourage the church, the Christians, to be united, to be of the same heart, the same purpose. What was dividing them was not legitimate concerns they had against each other, but what was dividing them was their own selfishness. And so he writes in verse three, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. See, he wanted them to put aside their selfishness and consider the humility and the example of Jesus. You know, I've often heard it been said by other preachers that throughout Philippians, the theme is joy, and it really is joy. And that we often can, can describe what joy looks like. It looks like when we live a life with Jesus as our focus, others as second, and yourself as third. And so they use the, the letters of joy, Jesus, others, you. And yet so often we want to try to spell joy by putting the why first. You can't spell joy by putting the why first and neither can you have joy by putting yourself first. Jesus wants us to put others' needs, others' preference ahead of our own. And look what scripture reminds us. As Jesus makes himself nothing as our example for our behalf, for our salvation, as Jesus humbles himself even to death for our salvation, look what God does. God super exalts Jesus. Look back with me, verse nine. I love this verse nine through verse 11. It kind of gets the preacher boy a little fired up. Verse nine, for this reason, God highly exalted him. That word literally is super exalted Jesus. For God highly exalted him and gave him a, the name that's above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God brings Jesus back to his position that he had back at the first, right at the Father's right hand in heaven. Back to his original glory in heaven. Jesus is, he is glorified and he is, he is exalted in heaven today as he was at the beginning of all creation. And the Bible says that God has given Jesus a name that's above every name. Now some would say that's the name Jesus. Some would say that's the name Lord. Others would say it's the name Yahweh or the I am. And whenever you want to fall on that, what's not debated is that God is pleased of Jesus emptying himself, humbling himself, and dying for our salvation. This hymn here brings to view a future time, the end of time. It brings to view a glorious day at the end that is coming, that describes the end of history when all people will acknowledge that Christ is Lord. Really, the, the, even the phrase in Christ is Lord is really a confession, maybe the first confessions uh, of the early church that Jesus is Lord. Here is a reminder that Jesus is Lord and that history is coming to a conclusion where everyone and everywhere will worship Jesus as Lord. It, it describes a time when every knee will bow, a time when every individual will submit to the lordship and the authority of Jesus. And every tongue will confess, everyone will worship Jesus for as who he is. I can't help as we read these 
things. As I read in my own personal time, my quiet time, I read some prophets speaking about the future day. I can't help but wonder, church, that we might be living in the last days. You know, it is strange and unusual days that we are in. And maybe these are days that God is bringing all of history to conclusion. I simply don't know, but I do know this, that Jesus is Lord, and one day, every individual will bow, and every individual will confess the lordship and the glory of Christ. It reminds us that we can worship Jesus. What can you and I do? How can you and I respond to this this savior, this example, this God that has died for our salvation, for our sins, for our behalf? We worship him. One of the things that your staff will be doing starting tonight, today is Palm Sunday. So starting tonight, And every day this week at six o'clock, if you'll tune in to either our YouTube channel or tune into our Facebook account, you will see a short five to seven minute video from one of your pastors or one of your deacon as we describe what Jesus is doing on this last week of his life. We call it Passion Week. And we do that wanting to help prep your heart just to worship all that Christ has done for you. This text is also a reminder that we can choose to worship Jesus now. Today, we can respond to Jesus and we can say, Jesus, be my Lord. Jesus, come into my life, be my Savior. And when we do, one day we will reign with Jesus. We will be in heaven. We will will see his glory for forever. But it's also a reminder that some individuals will choose to reject the Lord. Some individuals will, will, will choose to deny his lordship, but when Christ returns, when the conquering King Jesus comes, they will be made to bow, they will be made to worship, but they will not experience heaven. They will experience eternal damnation in hell. So the truth is, at one day we will all bow, we will all confess, but we will not all have the same eternal destinies. You know, as I read this, I can't help but reminded of the importance of receiving the gospel now. Maybe you're tuning in to Emmanuel for the very first time. Maybe this is the very first time that you've heard about who Jesus is or what he has endured or sacrificed for your salvation. And let me tell you, friend, he is a wonderful God. He is a God that you can trust your life with. Today, I want to encourage you not just to believe that there is a God or that Jesus did die, but I want to encourage you to turn to Jesus and ask him to be your Lord, to ask him to forgive you of your sins, to ask him to come into your life and to be your God and to save you. And you can do that by a prayer. You can pray right there where you're seated right now. And just in your own words, just ask Lord Jesus, Lord, forgive me of my sins, come into my life, And be my boss and save me. Take over my life, Lord. Be my Lord. Today, if you do that, I want to hear from you. Let me ask if you will, if you ask Christ to save you, if you have any questions about what it means to make Jesus your Lord and the importance of doing that now, would you email me? My email is just this. It's Sammy, S-A-M-M-Y, at ibcbenton.com. Or call us. Here's the church number. It's 618 439 Three, five, one, three. But this text reminds us of how important it is to turn to Jesus today. Church, I love you. And I love the way that you are responding in this pandemic. I really sense that many of you are responding in faith, are responding in trust, and that your relationship with Jesus is at a better point maybe than it's ever been in your life. And that really is what God wants you to do. As we consider Jesus, as we prepare for Easter, let's press in. Let's turn to the Lord. Let's follow his example. In a second, I'm gonna pray for you and um, our service will be over. And when we do, I want to ask for you and for whoever else is seated around you at this time, I'm going to ask you to to talk through two questions. The first question is this. 
I want to ask, just go around the room and just kind of finish this question. I celebrate how Jesus has. And think together all that you praise Jesus for doing and providing for you. This, this passage, this, this Christian hymn is rich with examples and illustrations of all that Jesus has done. So it shouldn't be hard to start that. I celebrate how Jesus has loved me enough to die on the cross for my sins. Go around the room and think together and just praise Jesus for what he's done for you. And then secondly, I want you to finish this question. I can live like Jesus by. See, this passage is an example for us of how we can follow Christ's example. So how can you live like Jesus in these days? I know of some uh, Sunday school teachers that they, they had a Zoom session with their high school girls just trying to provide a, a time that they're just checking on them. I know that others, we've had a high schooler that played her, her violin for nursing home residents and they could open up their windows and so she played her violin outside. For others, we had a deacon that dropped off CDs, individuals who might not have internet connections, others that cooked food, others that wrote encouraging cards, and others that called in on check on people. What can you do? How can you follow Jesus' example of caring for others' needs? What can you do for others in these days? I believe God will be pleased as you follow his example. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you, Lord, for loving us enough to send your son to die for our salvation. I pray, Father, that you would forgive us of selfishness, that you would forgive us, Father, of putting our needs above others. And Lord, you'd help us to care for others. You'd help us, Lord, just to worship you, Lord, to bend our knees, to, Lord, use our tongues just to describe, Lord, how much we love you and praise you. And so, Lord, help us not to go one more minute, one more second, Lord, without just, Lord, ascribing the worship and praise that you deserve. Now, Father, help us in these days. Help us today to turn to you like we've never turned before. In your son's name we pray. Let me encourage you, if you've not taken advantage of yet, to join one of our Zoom Sunday School classes. They'll start today at 9.30. We also have them for families on Wednesday, and we also even have one tonight at 8 p.m. And let's all, at this time, with those around your room, look at the two questions. I, can, I celebrate how Jesus has, and I can live like Jesus by. Until next time, we love you. God bless you, my friends.